Welcome to Living in a Land Down Dunder. Let's skip through this. So what is a Dunder method? It's simply a method that's prefixed with two double uh, or two underscores and postfixed with two underscores. Um, and these have specific meaning and value when implemented on a class, right? So um, what are some of the Dunder methods that you might already have played around with and know, uh, maybe come to love? Uh, one is Dunder string, right? We can define this and we can have instances of our class express themselves via the print statement in a much different way than maybe we're used to in the REPL, right? And well, we can talk a little bit about how to get this to look uh, prettier. That's using the Dunder wrapper method. But by defining the Dunder string method, we can pass an instance of this class to print and get it to print in a very customized way. It's just introducing you guys to the idea of, of Dunder methods if you haven't already played around with them. Um, a bunch of these come on a, a class when there's really nothing to find on the class. I actually probably should have made this an instance of the class. But we get the, a lot of these kind of out of the box. A lot of these don't actually do anything until we implement them. But uh, CPython already knows about them and wants to share them with you. It's just a matter of us getting around to writing the def statements. So. Um, what happens if we don't define that def statement? Well, we get back this unsupported operand type, right? So here in this class A, we're going to go ahead and define this dunder add method. Uh, and we'll get around to writing out the code for it in a later slide, but I just want to show you that if we define dunder add, great. Now we can add two instances of the class together. If we don't, we kind of fall back on the uh, default behavior for the class, which is just saying, I don't, Python says, I don't know how to handle that. Uh, you need to tell me. Uh, how do other languages handle this? Um, well, Python's pretty clean. C++ uh, is, there's definitely more characters on that line right there. Um, C sharp, even more letters and numbers and uh, symbols. Uh, Ruby, it takes three lines. Well, actually, hold on. That's not fair. It only, it takes less. I'm not trying to sway you towards Ruby. That does look pretty clean, though, right? Um, Java, no, there's no real way to overload that in the bit of research I did. PHP, no. Uh, JavaScript, yeah, <laughs> that, no, that ain't happening. Unless uh, something wild's happening in um, the next iteration that I don't know about. I have to ask my JavaScript friends, which I don't have many of. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I have one. That counts. Um, so let's actually play around with this, define this, and, and see what happens. Uh, let's say I define this class A. Uh, I define a dunder init method. What is the dunder init method used for? It's not for construction. It's for initialization. Yeah, that's why it's called dunder init rather than maybe dunder const or something like that in construction. Um, dunder new is the method for actually constructing a new object in memory, setting away some, uh, some space in memory and, and handing you back a handle to that like, memory address for the object, right? Uh, dunder init says, all right, I've already got the memory. Let me kind of configure it how I want it to be configured. Uh, and we'll define a class that, upon instantiation, just takes some value. And then, if I added an instance of this class to another instance of the same class with different values, well, I want you to just take their values and add those together in a way that you know how, right? Based on what they define as the way to add them. Um, and if I instantiate this A class with a 4 over here and an A uh, class with a 5, it operates in almost, it operates exactly how I'd expect, right? Just e uh, easy sum. And I got that out of the box. I really didn't have to do anything fancy to now make classes that uh, have a pretty sweet uh, semantic value, pretty sweet uh, usability. OK, let's do something um, a little bit more foreign, a lot more code on the screen. Um, how many of you know about the MATML operator? Yeah, OK, Brett, Brett uh, raises his hand with uh, exuberance. Yeah. I can still see if people are still, yes, I still know about it. Um, so this at symbol used to not be an operator, right? In Python 3.5, it was added in um, uh, for, I don't know, talk to Brett about the reasons, to talk to other co core developers about the reasons. There's a very long battle, as I understand, to get this in. But now 
this is an operator that we can use just like a plus or a minus or a times. Okay? However, not all objects come with a definition of like what to do when you're passed uh, to a uh, at sign. What do you do? So we have, it's on us, it's our burden to define what it, uh, what our objects should do when on either side of this at symbol. And to define that, we'll use the matrix multiplication dunder method or matmul uh, method. Normally, or I think the, the, the major thing that this dunder method was introduced for, this operator was introduced for, was for matrix multiplication. However, it's an at symbol, right? So I was thinking, like, okay, well, what else can you do with an at symbol that's maybe a little bit more at symbol-y? Um, and it's, you know, the email addresses are made up with at symbols, right? So maybe we can make up uh, an email chunk class that takes a chunk and uh, does some verification when you uh, map mole it with another chunk to see if it's a valid email address. Now, do I think this is good code? Nah. Uh, I, you could just pass the concatenated this chunk right here into is valid email and, you know, get your answer and move on. Um, but, I don't know, it sh goes to show that we really have a lot of flexibility over what our operators do in Python. Um, and that's really the whole point of this talk, is it's, Python is so flexible for us to do what we want. So, let's have a little bit of fun. Let's uh, create an integer class. And just no matter what, yeah, it's, yeah, true. It's equal to whatever else you uh, try and compare it against. Uh, so, we'll create one and an int two, and when you add them together, great, it's three. Uh, but when you check if one is equal to two, well, one comes in here, two comes in here, and no matter what, it's gonna be true. Um, push this to production and lose your job. Um, it's, it's one way to go out, right? <laughs> yeah, it's also two ways, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so classes are not the only thing that, uh, you know, have these dunder methods or instances of classes. Um, I, I could go a little bit uh, deeper and say that, let me back up. Functions are objects, right, in Python? Everything's an object pretty much in Python. A function is just an instance of the type function, right, or the class function. Um, and so functions come along with dunder methods. Uh, and you've probably already defined certain dunder method or dunder attributes uh, when you've added in these doc strings, or you definitely have if you've used doc strings. Uh, so to get at this uh, doc string, tools like Sphinx or other code analysis tools will uh, look at the dunder doc method to get that doc string. So that gets compiled and built into the function itself. Another use for Dunder methods and Dunder attributes. Um, when you build your function, um, the code for that function actually gets stuck onto the uh, function itself at Dunder code, which I think is very cool. You can watch uh, coroutines kind of uh, fall through their execution by looking at the Dunder code there. Um, so. Here's an example uh, where we define a real simple function, does pretty much nothing, but we look at under code, uh, and that's what, well, fair enough, it does nothing, so we get a bunch of zeros there, right? This is actually defining its return value and its index into the return value. Uh, and we'll, I'll show that as we go down here. So if I have uh, this function that now no longer does nothing but adds two things, uh, this code tells me that I need to return position two, uh, and then I actually don't know what this does. If somebody wants to come up and correct me after my talk or educate me, please do. But this right here tells us after you're done with your code or execution of uh, whatever I've defined in my function, hand back the second value. Uh, and I believe uh, the code is so simple here is because when Python runs through the parser, runs through it, it automatically does this computation out the gate, so it doesn't wait for us to... Uh, and Brett's giving me the, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, so it, when Python's parser runs through, it sees that this can be done, so it just does it. It doesn't wait till runtime to actually uh, calculate the value for you. Um, and jumping down to this next definition of f, 
Um, instead of returning some computation, I'm going to return just a constant, a string. Uh, and now it gives me back the uh, first value in a tuple of things to return. Uh, and why does it give me back the first thing? Um, well, this is this first, excuse me, this first, uh, this one value is an index into the tuple of constants that are on Dunder code uh, to be returned. So as it, this, if I could uh, redefine this value and showed you Dunder code.co consts, there'd actually be a none, which Brett can tell you more about why we hand back none at all, uh, and then one and two, because it compiles both things out and stores them as constants in there. Hmm. Okay, so what are all the value available Dunder methods? Uh, there's a long list of them. I encourage you to go look at them if this interests you, but I kind of wanted to talk about something else instead. Uh, we, th this could take hours to go over all the different Dunder methods, but that's not as interesting as talking about me trying to create my own Dunder method. Um, so I, I wanted to see how CPython internals work, so I started to develop this double caret character, double caret operator, and I wanted it to be a comparator operator. Uh, I wanted it to be something cute, so I made it these double carrots so it looked like cat ears. I'm going to make it a cat operator. Um, what will the cat operator do? Depends on uh, what it gets overridden with. So, so I, I started my dive, and uh, did I already jump over something? Oh, yeah. I started my dive, and I knew that I needed to update the grammar file from watching talks on this sort of thing before, so I went in and I did that. I added my two uh, cat ears. Um, and I was like, I know I need to define also how Python will interpret those cat ears, right? So I said, oh, it's probably in the abstract syntax tree code. So I went in there and I added in some abstract syntax tree code. Just saying, hey, I want this to make this a comparator operator. So uh, it's an operator that will take things on either side of it and compare those two objects. <clears throat> and it'll do some stuff which I don't fully understand, but I'll just copy the code from two lines above. Uh, and then let's try it. And I got fatal error. Um, make, and so it was my first few attempts. I said, okay, this, that makes sense, Paul. It's all right, just get yourself a little bit more tea and take another shot at it. <clears throat> so I grepped a little bit more and saw there were some things I was missing. Um, I added in a rich comparator uh, wrapper, which kind of creates code for me later on. Um, you can talk about that in detail later on. But basically, I said I needed to update the type object code. And the type object code in the, uh, the C Python internals defines how just your, your bare type works. And I know I uh, wanted my method to be done to cat, so I, I know I had to add in that. Um, Retried to compile, and all this junk came through. Uh, and this at the very end, type error, cat ears, not supported between instances of string and set. <clears throat> and then I sat here for a month, confused. <laughs> uh, I asked friends, and they, they just turned away and walked away. Uh, <laughs> I went and talked to my pre, my pastor. And, no, uh, the, I, I actually went and talked to James Powell, which you've probably seen him around. He's a man in a suit. Um, and he got confused. This is where you get a certain amount of validation. Go talk to James Powell about something in the C Python internals and have him stumped for about 45 minutes. And you feel like, yes, I am trying, I'm really pushing the bounds of what is to be known. Yeah, out there in the world. Um, he really knows a lot about CPython. So after a while, he said, oh, you know what I think this is? I think this is in peephole, which is another file in the CPython internals. Oh, yeah, this is just my, my feelings about that last line there in uh, GIF form. Um, but I realized that there was some optimization going on in peephole. And peephole, honestly, <laughs> they couldn't pick a creepier name for a file. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it looks ahead a little bit. It looks a little, oh, thank you, 10 minutes. Uh, it looks ahead a little bit uh, at your Python bytecode and says, oh, can I make an optimization based on what I know is coming next, right? 
Um, and I hadn't updated this file to account for um, some of the optimizations that were being done. And my cat ears were now being considered an in operator, like for blah, 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 in something else, or um, just a regular in statement to uh, check the contains uh, dunder method of an object. So uh, I went in and adjusted that a little bit. Uh, this was 2 a.m. on uh, you know, a Sunday morning, so pretty tired. But I got this. Python build finished successfully. Fantastic, right? I can go home super satisfied. Turns out, fun fact, Brad actually told me this the other day, um, this only pops up when Python did not completely build. <laughs> um, so if you're, if you're trying to build Python and this pops up, it's actually because Python notices that you've got some modules that aren't completely installed and, and ready to be built. If Python builds completely successfully with all the modules that it needs, nothing comes out. Um, so if you see this, you're almost there. Okay. Um, and so now I finally, you know, I started up uh, my, my executable. I typed in my class definition, dunder cat, print meow, and it worked. And then just the sigh of success, the sigh of, of happiness, a few tears, um, and then just like this overjoyed expression of happiness happened before I passed out and then just slept for like 12 hours. Um, what, is, what am I trying to say? Uh, out of all this. So what's the point? Um, that was, I'm a newbie. Uh, I'm a newbie at the C Python source. Uh, I'm not a newbie at Python, but I'm still, I would say, intermediate. I wouldn't say I'm advanced. Uh, and the things that I'm continuously learning is how flexible, uh, malleable, uh, adaptable Python is. I haven't written in Ruby. I haven't written uh, a ton of stuff in Haskell or C Sharp, but I have written plenty of stuff in Python, and I've talked to a lot of people who have been writing in Python for 15 years. And the attitude is uh, Python can really bend to what you need it to bend to. And not because it's a flimsy language, but because it's showing everything it has to offer there. Right? It shows you, this is what I've got to offer, Make me do what you need me to do. If you need to change stuff in my C Python source, you can do it. With a month of crying and falling asleep in despair, you can do it. No, really, you, you can do this much easier than that. Um, if you want to change how your Python should be read or, or how your code should be read, it absolutely can be done. Um, just let me know how to do it. Um, and with that, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, yeah, Brett. Oh, uh, I saw, actually, you discovered a slight hole in the malleability of those people, or did you submit a patch that's written as asked people to? I, I didn't. I have not yet, but it's definitely it. So here's the reason I haven't submitted that patch is because James said, I found that. Let me do that. <laughs> like, you're going to take credit for my finding in people because um, he, you know, he really directed me towards this. Uh, but I don't know. If James doesn't get to it in the next week, I, I'm definitely going to throw a patch up. Yep. Cool. <laughs> Hi, yeah, Found a hole in the peephole. I really want to stop saying people. Yeah. I feel like uh, I'm already pretty creepy as just a bald guy hanging on, so. Bald guy, I'm not creepy. Yeah, wake up, man, wake up. <laughs>